We'll kick off with Cynthia Gaylor, our CFO, interviewing our CEO, Dan Springer. After that, our COO, Scott Ulrich, will dive deeper into why we win and how we differentiate with our broader agreement cloud. You'll also have the chance to hear from a couple of customers as they join Scott to discuss their journey with DocuSign. Next, our head of engineering, Tom Casey, will take you through the key elements of our Agreement Cloud platform and walk you through the life cycle of an agreement. After a short break, Lauren Adelhoff, our CRO, will talk about our multifaceted go-to-market strategy. And finally, Cynthia will walk through some key financial highlights and we will close the day with a Q&A session that I'll be moderating with our presenters. Before we get started, just a few housekeeping items to note. We expect the presentation to be about two and a half hours long in total. Thanks, Annie, and thanks for joining us today for our first annual Analyst Day. Uh, we thought we'd try something a little bit different today, so we have Dan here with us for a fireside chat to answer all of investors' burning questions. Hey, Dan, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, Cynthia. I'm excited to be here. We really enjoyed your Momentum keynote this morning. Oh, thank you. I enjoyed doing that. So, hey, let's get to it. Um, so some, some have been pegging us as a work from home stock and mm -hmm. um, the permanence of the trends we've been seeing across the business look like they're really here to stay. Um, we also on our uh, earnings call last week talked a little bit about the anywhere economy. So I want you to um, talk to us a little bit about why investors um, should be excited about the anywhere economy and where DocuSign plays in that. Yeah, it's interesting. I think investors should be excited about the anywhere economy for DocuSign, but even more broadly than that. We think this is a really important phenomenon that's going to shape the way th people think about not just work, but also what consumers do. And it's one of the things that's really interesting about DocuSign, because of course we're a B2B software company, but we also have this incredible consumer relationship. Right? A billion people have signed to DocuSign. And so we're kind of at the nexus of both of those. And I actually think the anywhere economy really captures the fact that it's not just work from home or work from anywhere and it's not just uh, transact or, or individuals do their you know, consumer operations from home or anywhere it's all those coming together and that's why I think it's important and that's why we think DocuSign is really well positioned because we're able to meet both sides the business side and the consumer side bring those together in this opportunity that the that has really been opened up to do it to do business anywhere yeah well I'm looking forward to seeing how that plays out over time yeah. Um, so over the course of the last year, we've um, we've seen a lot of strength across e-signature, and we've talked about how we've seen acceleration in the overall business, but also some deceleration in some of the more complex agreement products. And so how do you see this playing out, and when do you think our products outside of signature will really see some traction? Um, and what do you think the needle movers will be, you know, over what period of time? Yeah, well, I think, first of all, you're spot on that in fiscal year 21, you know, our customers came to us and they fundamentally said, we need signature and we need it now. Because of the pandemic, they had so many uh, use cases and business processes, they just had to get, you know, online. Uh, and we were, of course, pleased to really ramp up, uh, as you said, and have that extra growth and provide that. But we also saw some of the other agreement cloud products. We saw that in the advanced analytics with SEAL. We saw that in the CLM products where people said, you know, those are really important things to do, but they're not urgent in the same way that getting sales contracts out uh, when you no longer had a way to do that. Um, so I think we found that, that that slowed a little bit from the really good pace that we had at the beginning of the year pre-COVID. Going forward, I think we're starting to see that come back. If we look at what's building in our pipeline, we see particularly in CLM and CLM Plus, where we sort of involve that advanced analytics and AI into the overall CLM product, that's going to be a real growth area for us. And I think we're going to see that really kick off in fiscal year 22 to start to reaccelerate, and that will become noticeable as a growth driver in our business literally this year. Well, that's a good segue to my next question around um, growth drivers. So international has been just over 20% of our revenue. And we've talked about that as one of the biggest um, growth opportunities for the company. Um, and we say that it should really be a bigger percentage of revenue um, given the scale of our company. So when you think about the key things that we need to do to really make that happen and your confidence level in those items, um, how do you think about that and how does International take more share for us? Yeah, well, first off, I think uh, well, you're spot on again that I do believe we should be bigger. If you think about a company that's going to be doing you know, the guidance you just gave was 
you know, basically $2 billion of revenue this year, uh, you would expect to be more than 20% of that for a software company uh, outside of the U.S. I think part of the history here is that the DocuSign was slow to build an international business. Initially, we had such a great opportunity domestically, but also because of the different uh, formats, the legal formats, common law, civil law, um, it took more investment and more time to really have a broad-based international strategy. But you and I were going over this the other day, that if you actually plot the growth of our domestic business and then time adjusted back for when we entered our international markets, the growth levers look exactly the same and the growth results are about the same. So we actually look at our business and say, I think it's on track for what we would expect it to be in the international markets. We just got a little bit later start. Um, at the same time, I think there's a lot more we can do to ensure that we get that international growth that's faster than the domestic business, which is going to continue to grow at a good rate. So international is going to have to grow at a really elevated rate to take share. I think digital is going to be a big piece of that. Digital has always been an opportunity for us to get into additional markets. You know, we've had DocuSign customers in like 180 different countries, but the vast, vast majority of the countries of the world. Uh, and many of them, of course, are small uh, on that long tail. But I think that we can use that as an entry strategy, and then we see where we see sort of that relevance and resonance in the marketplace, and then we can put more investment in those markets, both digitally, but also with our direct business. And I do think over the next couple of years, you'll probably see us go beyond our focus focused eight, where we have a lot of physical presence in those key eight markets, I think you'll see us probably look for another market or two to enter. So on top of the digital, the intensifying of the direct business, and then potentially adding a few more direct markets, I think you're going to see international continue to take share. Yeah, well, you've given um, investors a lot of good tea leaves to look for kind of going forward, yeah. um, you know, as we, um, as we report out how that's going. Um, so internally, we talk a lot about um, delighting our customers and customer success, and it's a big area of investment for us. So how do you think about that in the context of uh, driving revenue, but also our record net retention rate? Yeah. I mean, I think it, when you talk about customer success, before I can even talk about those metrics, it really goes at, I like to think about the soul of who we are as a company. And if you're a SaaS company and you're not heavily focused on customer success, you, you are really missing uh, the boat. But I think what's special about DocuSign is we've not only made it a part of our business driver, we've made it a part of our culture. Our employees are so proud to work at a company that is so focused on customer success that we not only don't get a lot of customer attrition, we don't get employee attrition. So we've been operating under 10% attrition, which is fairly unheard of in the software world you know, for years now because of that our customers are proud to work here. But then turning to the piece you asked about directly, um, I do think things like net retention rate are a fantastic indicator that we're getting adoption right and then we're getting therefore success. And at DocuSign, when we get adoption right, success happens naturally because the ROI is so high from, you know, from our core products. So I think the big investment we made a few years ago, and we said explicitly to investors, we are going to put more investment in customer success than any other part of the company, and we did. And that means we've, we've seen great success. So our revenue growth has been high. Looking at that net retention, we came out when we were public and we said like 112 to 119, we felt pretty confident as a range we'd stay in. But with all that um, successful investment in success, you know, we've now been above 120 uh, the last few quarters. Um, I don't know whether we're gonna be able to you know, maintain that because the compares get tougher and tougher, as you know well as a CFO, uh, when you have that great retention rate, to then have a retention rate on top of that, uh, that to stay at that rate is even more work. Um, but at the same time, I'll tell you, the focus we're putting on driving customer success, I think we're gonna see fantastic results on those metrics uh, for years to come. Yeah, it's funny, you talk about kind of digital first, how we went digital first for our customers, but when you yeah. think about it internally at the company, it's really kind of a customer first culture, which yeah. is really um, awesome to see. So kind of when we think kind of far into the future, or maybe not that far into the future, and we think about our path to $5 billion in revenue, what do you think DocuSign's biggest challenges and our biggest opportunities to scaling to $5 billion and beyond will be? Yeah. I mean, I think it's funny, first of all, how fast it's happening, right? We, uh, a couple of years ago, or we hit a billion, and everyone sort of said, what's next? Is it $2 billion? And I actually realized just the momentum we had in our business, that $2 billion was going to happen, you know, if we didn't get in our own way. And in fact, it only took two years to go from a billion to what, you know, we're now projecting for $2 billion this year. Um, so I think we're going to get to $5 billion, uh, you know, faster than we think. But I do think the focus we're trying to make on $5 billion requires us to do a couple things differently. One, we really want to take that DocuSign Agreement Cloud platform 
broader than our core e-signature business, that's going to help a lot. I think we could get there with the size of the, you know, the TAM for signature alone. We could get to a $5 billion company for sure. Um, but our customers are asking for more than that. And so I do think that's a, a big piece of the $5 billion story. I think internally we're going to have to make a lot of investments in our team. And we're going to have to grow the absolute size of the team for sure. But at the same time, I think that we're going to have to think about people who have had some of those experiences that have seen that sort of level of scale. Uh, and we're going to bring in people, not unlike you know, bringing you in as our CFO, who we, we really believe can get us to that, to that next level of scale. Um, and then you know, the, the last thing I think is really important is not to do something, and that's not to change our culture. And one of the things I like to talk about, an expression I know you've heard me use many times in the past, is we're not going to have DocuSign become a big company. We're going to have DocuSign stay a small company it just happens to have lots of employees, lots of revenue, lots of customers, lots of success. And I think if we can keep that, um, that's going to be a big part of us enabling the $5 billion scale. Well, I'm looking forward to doing that with you. So yeah. um, that's great. So maybe to, to, to wrap things up, because we have a, a full agenda um, kind of following our, our fireside chat here. Um, so uh, maybe just a, a more um, interesting macro question. So when you think about, you've just crossed kind of being four years CEO at um, DocuSign. What's been the biggest surprise about the business um, that you didn't expect? And then maybe a fast follow to that. How, uh, what are you most excited about um, in a post-COVID world? Yeah, it's an interesting question because I feel like I should have really thoughtful you know, insights and all these things I expected to be one way and turn out to be another way. The part that's really surprising here is how few surprises I think I've had. And I don't think that's because I was particularly insightful about what was going to happen. I think it's that it's been a very straightforward run. When I joined, it was very clear that we had a fantastic technology platform and we had an incredibly high ROI for our customers, and we had what we call DocuLove. We had all these customers saying we love using DocuSign products. So that's a pretty good foundation. Um, we had some operational things along the way that we had to get right, but basically we've been focused on meeting that need for the market fit that we have with a fantastic product. If there's anything that's happened differently or maybe at a different pace would be the, the breadth uh, at which we've built out the DocuSign Agreement Cloud vision and, and the sort of rapidity that that's you know, happened in. Normally, I think it would have taken us longer for a company to come to that broader vision, but we got there fast. Uh, and I think we now have that vision that's going to take us to $5 billion. Um, and that's somewhat surprising, I think, to, to get there that quickly and that sort of maturing out of the really broader long-term vision. And then that really leads right into, I guess, the second half of your question, what does me excited about this place? is I think we're not just building a great software company, although I do think we're doing that. I think we're building a category. And I think we have an opportunity uh, when we will look back five years from now, we'll say to ourselves, there's a category. There's a software category for the agreement cloud. It did not exist before our company. And there'll be other players in it. It won't just be us. There'll be other players in the space for sure. But they'll all say they're agreement cloud companies. And I think one of my biggest prides will be the fact that we can say we built a category. It didn't exist uh, without us. In that case, we did our little bit of changing the world. That's what I'm probably most excited about at DocuSign. Well, that's awesome, Dan. Thank you. And so with that, I think that's a good segue over to Scott, don't you? I think it's a perfect segue. You know, and, and interesting for people that, that maybe don't know, but Scott and I have a tremendous amount of history together uh, at previous companies as well. And we've now been working together for 17 years. Uh, he's been putting up with me. And Scott really was, you know, as Cynthia just sort of uh, in indicated, the architect of the DocuSign Agreement Cloud vision. And now as our COO, he's got the responsibility to be uh, really responsible for driving a lot of the operational components uh, that make that DocuSign Agreement Cloud vision become a reality. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to you, Scott. Thanks, Dan, and thanks, Cynthia. And hello, everyone. My name is Scott Ulrich, and I'm the Chief Operating Officer of the company. And we're looking forward to digging in with you today. As you've been hearing over the last several years now, we're positioning ourselves as the Agreement Cloud Company. It's the path that we've been on, and it's the path that we're going to continue to pursue. Because as Dan mentioned earlier, it's what our customers want from us, and it's what we believe is the next big cloud software category, and we're uniquely positioned to win it. To help frame up where our true opportunity lies, it's at the intersection of the digital transformation of business processes and agreement processes. You have Salesforce and Microsoft 
focusing on winning the transformation dollars of the front office business processes of marketing, sales, and service. And you have Workday, SAP, Oracle, Intuit on the small business side, and ServiceNow, all focused on winning the transformation dollars in the back office in HR, ERP, and IT. DocuSign is focusing on transforming the underlying agreements and agreement processes. This was an area already experiencing rapid transformation. And as we accelerate into what we refer to as the anywhere economy, we will increasingly become the world's anywhere answer for agreements. It's like being Salesforce 20 years ago, talking about the opportunity for CRM in the cloud. Just like most every organization needed a modern CRM system to manage its customer relationships, every organization will need an agreement cloud to manage its agreements. Our agreement cloud is a suite of applications, integrations, and a platform for automating the entire agreement process. In the next few minutes, I'm going to go deeper on how we'll leverage these components of the agreement cloud to consistently win and differentiate in the marketplace. And after that, I'll invite a few customers, Snowflake and Unilever, to join me. They'll explain their journeys from e-signature into the broader agreement cloud product portfolio. Does that sound good? Great. Okay, to start. The first reason we win and differentiate is that we offer the best way to agree to anything, anywhere. No matter the agreement use case or where you are in the world, whether in a civil law country or a common law country, we are the best way to agree to anything, anywhere. Of course, it started with e-signature. We pioneered the category and our name is synonymous with electronic signing. We believe we spend more on R&D than every other competitor combined. And it shows in our capabilities. It shows in our availability. And it shows in our 350 pre-built integrations. No one can touch that. But signing is only a part of the story. With our Identify framework, we provide the most native options for enhanced identification of signers, like an SMS code or checking a photo ID. And we have a product called Click for non-signature required click wrap agreements that still have the audit trails of e-signature. And of course, if you saw Momentum event earlier today, you saw the debut of DocuSign Notary, which allows notarizations via video conference with notary specific tools and auditability. That's big. We also have region specific offerings like eHonko in Japan, an e-witness for the UK and Australia. No other company approaches this level of comprehensiveness and enabling people to agree to anything, anywhere, period. The second reason we win and differentiate is that we've assembled the most comprehensive set of product offerings and professional services to automate the entire end-to-end -end agreement process. Getting into CLM was our first big move two years ago with the acquisition of Spring CM. Now a leader in both Forrester and Gartner reports on contract lifecycle management. We bought it initially for its strength on the sell side, which means automating sales agreements that our customers originate. Since then, we've been making big enhancements on the buy side, which means handling contracts originating from third parties such as vendor agreements. Now the goal is to provide a single CLM system that all departments can leverage. Next, we help our customers find and analyze all the contracts that they already have with our Insight product. It's based on SEAL software's pioneering agreement AI, which can analyze and search not just by keywords, but also legal concepts. Analyzer, builds on Insight to automatically analyze incoming agreements for risks, like an analyst in support of a company's legal team. It can also be combined with CLM to automatically route contracts to different specialists based on a risk assessment. 
And then there's DocuSide Gen, a lighter weight tool that allows reps to generate a contract with a few clicks right within Salesforce. We recently added a version of Gen specialized for quotes and billing. And these products are actually sold by Salesforce's sales team. So it's a great collaboration there. These are just a few of our products that automate aspects of the agreement process before and after signing. Tom will showcase these products more in his demo in a little bit. Our customers and prospects are seeing that we have the best suite of products and that we're putting all the pieces of the puzzle together for them. And we're doing it in an integrated fashion. And lastly, the third reason we win and differentiate is that we're quickly becoming our customers platform a record for agreements. That means we're providing a centralized repository where all agreements can be stored and searched. We believe we're already storing more agreements than any other company in the world. So we bring a lot of credibility to this topic. We're also working to extend our object model from being e-signature centric to encompass the entire agreement process. As we do that, we're building the infrastructure not just for traditional Word or PDF agreements, but also for emergent technologies like active or smart contracts that include running code. Any modern platform needs APIs. We've always differentiated here, and it represents the majority of our transactions going through our platform today. And finally, I should mention a product we recently launched called Monitor. It automatically tracks e-signature activity, looking for patterns that indicate a threat, such as an attempt to delete a lot of agreements. It's just another step in our security story, where we're going beyond making our platform secure to help our customers maintain their own security against rogue insiders and external threats. So as the only public scale company focused on agreement technology, we believe we're pulling away with these big investments in a fully modern platform or record for agreements, which will become a bigger and bigger differentiator going forward. So that hopefully gives you a better sense of how we win and differentiate with the various components of the agreement cloud today, but more importantly, how we're investing to be well positioned to win long into the future and to take a big chunk of what we believe is the next big TAM opportunity in cloud software. Speaking of which, as most of you already know, we work with a top three strategy firm and shared our initial analysis that pegged the e-signature TAM, which included click wrap agreements at about 25 billion. On top of that, if you include the broader sign offerings and other parts of the agreement cloud, we're looking at a TAM in excess of 50 billion. And since the original analysis, we've outpaced our assumptions in some key verticals like public sector. So we believe there's even further upside on top of that. And of course, the vast majority of the TAM is unpenetrated by anyone. We're widely considered the leader, but our penetration in the United States is in the low single digits. And for the rest of the world, where the majority of the TAM is, our penetration is even lower. So we believe we have lots of room to run for a long, long time. Okay, you've been very patient, and I promised you that I would bring out a few great customers to join me. So without further ado, let's go out to the General Counsel of Unilever in London and the CIO and Chief Digital Officer of Snowflake right here in Silicon Valley. Well, thank you, Wei Ling and Sunny, for joining our analyst day. It's great to have you both here. Thank you. Thanks, Scott, for having us. Great to be here. Thanks, Scott, for having us. Looking forward to the discussion. Great. Um, so we have an exciting uh, talk ahead of us, uh, but I thought it would be great if we could just start with a quick round of introductions. So Wei Ling, can we start with you to share a little bit about your role within Unilever? Sure. So I'm based in London and I'm the Global Supply Chain General Counsel. Uh, together with my team, we uh, support and partner 
the supply chain function, the procurement function, and the UniOps function uh, within uh, Unilever. And also, I'm the global lead for our Future First program, uh, which is our legal team's global digital transformation program. Sunny, uh, how about you? Yeah, so I'm uh, the CIO as well as a CDO for Snowflake, uh, based out of San Mateo. Great. Well, uh, a huge success story at Snowflake. So I know they have you uh, very, very busy uh, uh, there uh, at the moment. So uh, we really appreciate uh, both of you uh, joining us today and sharing your stories. Um, the first question I, I want to pose to both of you is if you could just talk uh, to our investors a little bit about how you began your relationship with DocuSign, kind of why you chose DocuSign in the first place, and, and a little bit about how that relationship's evolved over the years. So Wei Ling, let's go back to you. So Unilever started working with DocuSign about five to six years ago uh, with its uh, e-signature capability. This capability is widely used within Unilever across different locations in our global operations and also across different functions within Unilever as well. Um, since then, we uh, worked with Spring CM back when it was an independent company uh, to uh, leverage its uh, contract automation, contract building capabilities. And a little bit later, we uh, also started partnering with SEAL uh, back when it was an independent company, um, wanting to take advantage of its contract analytics uh, capabilities. So Wei Ling, you were putting the agreement cloud together before there was an agreement cloud. Uh, why was that so important to Unilever? I guess it stemmed from the realization that, you know, there will always be more than enough for all of us to do. Um, there's never enough time to get everything done. And so primary driver was to find ways to give time back to our colleagues, give time back to our business partners um, so that they can do uh, even more value add work. Um, and also to uh, create capabilities that will generate uh, data-driven insights for them that they can take action on. And uh, so uh, it was with this in mind that, you know, we wanted to take advantage of the contract automation, the contract building capabilities, and the contract analytics capabilities in the Greenland Cloud. Okay, so let me go to Sunny on this one. Sunny, can you tell us a little bit about how your initial relationship with DocuSign uh, began, why you chose DocuSign in the first place, and and kind of how that relationship's evolved over the last couple of years? Yeah, so uh, Scott, we started um, uh, much earlier in the DocuSign journey on e-signatures, and so we were using e-signatures for, for quite some time before I joined the company. Uh, when I joined the company, one of the big pain points for us was um, you know, CPQ deployment that we had done many years ago was not scaling in a graceful manner that we needed for how the business was changing for us, how the business was growing for us. So I bought in uh, Salesforce to come in and do an audit, you know, really identify what were all the pain points in the CPQ implementation that we had done in the past and what should we do different in trying to automate the process. And in that audit, one of the big things that came high and clear was we needed to implement a CLM solution that would allow the business process to be a lot more automated, a lot more compliant, uh, wouldn't have any defects. Uh, and, and in the evaluation process, we ended up choosing um, uh, DocuSign. We had many other companies that we were evaluating, uh, but we did a POC with you guys. We felt good about it, and we ended up choosing you guys. And uh, we, we, it's kind of a common theme we see, Sunny, is when folks are thinking about transforming their sales processes, sometimes they forget that they need to transform the underlying agreement processes that connect with those sales processes. Clearly, you uh, found that to be very important when you were thinking about the transformation of CPQ at the same time as CLM. Um, why did you pick uh, DocuSign CLM? What, what stood apart uh, for you? Yeah, I would say that the two big reasons why we chose you guys, one was your seamless integration with Salesforce. Um, professionals in the business uh, don't like to use multiple different applications and go in and out in completing a workflow. They want that whole workflow to be seamless where it's, you know, uh, you go from one part of the process to another part of the process in a seamless manner. Our evaluation, our POC clearly uh, gave you guys a uh, high thumbs up on that seamless integration you guys have built with Salesforce. So that was the 
primary reason. And then the second reason was the competitor landscape that you, we were looking at that competed with you guys. Uh, we didn't feel they had a strong roadmap like you guys did, as well as there was a lot of consolidation and private equity companies coming into that, into that space. And so we needed to partner with a company like yours uh, who has a rich product in the current offering, but also promises a future roadmap uh, that we could take advantage of. And we didn't feel the competitors that you that we were looking at uh, offered that same level of uh, solution. Uh, so hence, we chose you guys. Great. Thanks, Sunny, for sharing that perspective. Well, that's a great segue. Maybe I'll go back to Wei Ling. The next question I'd love to hear is, you know, you're all in different levels of the transformation of your agreement processes. Can you talk to us about kind of what the next use cases that you're thinking about? Where do you see the next opportunities to apply the agreement cloud uh, in your business? Uh, Weiling? So as you know, Unilever has operations across many parts of the world. Uh, I think there's a huge opportunity to extend the agreement cloud capabilities to operations that are in places where English is not the main language for the business. Um, so in other words, you know, the non-English capabilities of Agreement Cloud, I think there, there's a lot of potential there. Um, I guess the other one is also just deepening and broadening the contract analytics capabilities within Agreement Cloud uh, so that, you know, you can continue to generate more and more insights for our end users. Uh, and speed up contracting, uh, avoid uh, that leakage, and also to just give time back to people. Great, great. Clearly, a lot going on. Um, Sunny, how about you? What's what's next on the on the forefront for uh, Snowflake, and how you're going to apply the Agreement Cloud? Yeah. So for us, Scott, there are two. It's twofold. Uh, one, one, the first one is um, we just went live with our uh, CPQ CLM on the sell side, right? So it's the whole sales process automation that integrates with CLM. So that's done, uh, but with that comes newer areas, newer geographies, uh, newer uh, language requirements, just like Unilever use cases. We also are going to grow and scale our company and get into new markets. So we have that same requirement. But in addition to that, we also, the second area that we are going to focus this year is on the buy side, on the procurement side. Uh, there's a, a lot of suppliers that we uh, integrate with. There's a lot of supplier contracts that are all over the place for us that we want to um, have a one big repository and integrate with um, Workday, which is our core ERP system. So we are pretty excited about both, both fronts of uh, use cases that we're going to roll out this year. Great. That's kind of a common theme we see a lot is that we'll have CLM customers that will start in the front office or the sell side, but then move to the buy side. And obviously, it sounds like you're doing further integration into other applications. So uh, that's great. Well, I think we have a, a, a couple more minutes. I thought uh, it'd be great if we could end uh, asking you, what are the couple things that you'd like to see from DocuSign? What do you want to see on our product roadmap or what do you want to see um, us accomplish over the next couple of years as an important partner? Uh, Wei Ling, uh, we'll, we'll start with you. Great question. Um, I think one of the learnings for me, especially brought on by the pandemic where, you know, we're all working um, uh, virtually, uh, where we're working agilely and so in terms of flexibility, uh, the, the need for a virtual repository of our legal content um, is, is, is clear to me. And I think there's definitely a potential uh, to work with DocuSign and explore the capabilities in that space. And I think the other one is to connect the agreement cloud to, out, to well, maybe external sources, but other online resources uh, so that, you know, there's a closed loop uh, in terms of insights, information, and notification to us as well. That, that was my phone notifying me there. <laughs> <laughs> you got an alert already. We got, we got yeah. that feature done for you. Yes, indeed. <laughs> Sunny, so what would you like to see uh, from DocuSign? What are those couple big things you'd like to see us uh, accomplish on the road, product roadmap? Yeah, Scott, I would say that uh, the... Number one request for us would be that 
um, how, how do you guys invest in the in the education and training ecosystem of your platform? Uh, we used a, a third-party consulting company in the initial stages of our rollout, um, and we have hired uh, some folks in, in the organization who have expertise uh, in DocuSign, but it's really, really hard to find that type of talent uh, in, in, in the industry. And so I think combination of your professional services organization, your training organization, uh, as well as your um, uh, system integrators that partner with you, uh, there needs to be an, um, a really good plan on how you guys are going to uh, increase the investment and how to uh, train the IT professionals uh, that, on how they are going to get trained on DocuSign platform because we see more rollouts coming out and I don't want to be dependent on consultants for that. I want to have my own team uh, keep turning this uh, automation journey that we have in front of us. And um, and we will hire more people that are DocuSign uh, experienced professionals. And it's and so you guys got to think about how do you create that, that ecosystem for us? Great. So I heard from both of you the importance of this common repository for your agreements that can be accessed anywhere in the world. And, and also the increasing need to certify people within your organizations uh, and also being able to leverage an ecosystem, whether it's our professional services or agreement cloud practices that are being created by the SIs. Well, we're out of time, but I want to thank Wei Ling and Sunny so much for sharing your insights with our investors today. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you, uh, Scott, for having us. Had a good discussion. I appreciate it. Okay. To show off some of his latest innovations and to get deeper into the platform that will allow us to truly scale, I'm gonna pass it over to Tom Casey, our SVP of product and engineering, who is socially distanced up in our Seattle development office. Out to you, Tom. Thank you, Scott. Hello, everyone. I'm Tom Casey. I lead product development, design, and technology operations worldwide at DocuSign. As you've heard, Every company needs to prepare, sign, act on, and manage their agreements. The DocuSign Agreement Cloud is the only solution that enables companies to transform and integrate the entire agreement process from end to end. We believe this is important because companies want to work with a single technology platform rather than a collection of piecemeal products. The Agreement Cloud builds on the trusted brand and platform we evolved with eSignature. It's composed of dozens of modular capabilities that are designed for reuse across our applications. Agreements shouldn't exist in a vacuum. So DocuSign and our ecosystem partners have delivered more than 350 pre-built integrations to the most common applications people use every day. Our modularity and award-winning APIs power our native applications, partner extensions to DocuSign, and the applications our larger customers build themselves. About 60% of our new transactions originate from third parties using our APIs. We believe in offering a powerful open application platform, even as we strive to enable our customers to do more with clicks, not code. The DocuSign platform exhibits unparalleled scalability and reliability in our category. We process millions of transactions per day with almost five nines availability and zero downtime for maintenance. We can do so in part because even after 15 plus years of working to make our services scale, we are constantly investing to instrument, to optimize, and to protect our platform and application services. We compute more than 800 billion operational metrics per day as our services run in real time. We believe that trust is the foundation of any system of record. And with billions of documents under management, DocuSign acts as a system of record for agreements for many organizations. With our acquisition of SEAL software last year and internal investments in machine learning, we are infusing artificial intelligence and bringing actionable insights to every part of the agreement cloud. With our insights product, we offer pre-built, industry-specific models, and a built-in decision engine along with accelerators for industries like financial services and legal to help reduce risk. You've already seen the everyday application of machine learning and automating tasks such as those featured in the automatic tagging of documents in eSignature. And in just a moment, 
you'll see how these same AI engines help customers derive insights from related agreements and the documents they contain as part of everyday contract lifecycle management. I want you to consider for a moment that 47% of businesses say they experience risk from an inability to proactively detect problematic contract language. We believe providing purpose-built contract analytics applications is only a part of the solution. Everybody working with agreements at any stage of the life cycle can benefit from AI-assisted experiences. The DocuSign Agreement Cloud is for all businesses, from true small businesses to the largest enterprise. Most people work with just one part of an agreement process, so sometimes it can be hard to envision how it all comes together. Rather than tell you, I thought it'd be more fun to show you with a couple of examples. SMB customers, as one example, have a lot of simple sales agreements that they need to prepare, to sign, to act on, and to manage. To make it easy for SMBs, the Agreement Cloud meets customers in the applications they use every day, providing an embedded and natural experience. For example, SMB customers can start in Salesforce, as shown here. By clicking right inside the Salesforce Opportunity Record, they can access the embedded DocuSign Gen functionality to automate the creation of customized, professional-looking agreements, such as sales quotes, MSAs, invoices, and more, without ever having to leave the Salesforce application. Now, in this case, we select Generate Quote, and a quote is automatically generated for us. With Gen, data like account information, contact information, and even product and pricing information from Salesforce is automatically merged into the document. Tables can also update dynamically, and the agreement layout is preserved. The result is an agreement that's accurate and on-brand. And all of this automation is done with clicks, not custom code. Now that a final document has been seamlessly created, the next step is to get the customer to sign the agreement. As with all of our products, Gen integrates seamlessly with DocuSign eSignature. The generated document is added to a new DocuSign envelope. Recipients and other key data are automatically added from the Salesforce record. Tags and signature blocks can be added as well, and if the sales rep wants to add or adjust a field, that's pretty easy. Now, once everything is ready to be signed, the sales rep clicks the Send with DocuSign button, and off it goes. So, no more faxing, no emailing PDFs, or physically delivering paper copies. DocuSign eSignature and DocuSign Gen accelerate the agreement process for customers by managing a seamless handoff from Gen, by quickly notifying the signer via the apps that they already use, like email or Slack, or of course, our own web and mobile applications. Now, continuing the seamless experience, the signer can easily read and sign agreements in a format that fits their screen thanks to our multi-format rendering engine and HTML-based responsive signing. Creating the agreement and getting it signed is just the first half of the agreement process. Just as Gen and eSignature automated and streamlined the creation and signing of the agreement, DocuSign simplifies acting on the obligations in an agreement or automating common workflows with something we call agreement actions. Agreement actions are pre-built workflow tasks they let DocuSign customers automate common post-signature processes like conditionally notifying stakeholders, copying documents to content management systems, or exporting data, as is the case here. Again, they do all this with clicks and not code. Users can easily create rules and conditions based on e-signature document fields, the template type, and other metadata to drive automatic post-signature actions. Here, we're going to configure an agreement action to export the results directly to a Google Sheet if the internal alias, sales1 at tally.com, receives a sales order update that says something is closed one. Now, a common challenge for SMBs is dealing with the multiple systems that they have to piece together a view of their operational world. Once an agreement's completed, the opportunity automatically updates to closed one in Salesforce. And since DocuSign, eSignature, and Gen are natively integrated with Salesforce, a copy of the agreement is automatically stored in Salesforce as well as in DocuSign, ensuring continuity in existing systems after the agreement is signed. This example, featuring DocuSign Gen for Salesforce and our eSignature integration, is just one of many examples of how the Agreement Cloud helps small businesses 
prepare, sign, act on, and manage their agreements. Our integration with Salesforce, in fact, is just one of the many ways that we make working with agreements an embedded and natural part of the applications people use every day. In addition to providing great experiences that help real customers, these integrations are often excellent GTM accelerators as well. In our joint GTM with Intuit, the e-signature integration that Intuit built themselves within QuickBooks Online Advanced features the ability to connect an existing DocuSign account or to start a free trial. Now, while there's a lot that happens throughout the life cycle of an agreement, it doesn't have to be complicated. Everybody wants a better experience. For large companies or companies with more complex requirements, we can help there too. In our next example, we'll highlight how DocuSign CLM and DocuSign eSignature come together to deliver on the promise of the agreement cloud for demanding global companies like Shell, Unilever, and so many more. Earlier today, we looked at how DocuSign makes it easy for any customer to generate, negotiate, and manage approvals for a sales agreement. There's another important area where contract lifecycle management is growing, namely source to pay, or what are commonly known as buy-side scenarios, like those frequently encountered in procurement. The prepare, sign, act, and manage phases of these agreements are often complicated by the counterparty's control of portions of the overall agreement process. On the sell side, you tend to generate your own agreements, but on the buy side, you frequently receive agreements prepared on someone else's paper. You saw a fairly simple demonstration of the sell side CLM capabilities for SMBs earlier today. Now, let's take a look at how DocuSign CLM, DocuSign Analyzer, and integrations with the likes of SAP Ariba, NetSuite, and Workday help companies quickly find, process, and report on existing vendors and agreements. Procurement teams work with multiple systems, with hundreds of suppliers and often thousands of purchasing agreements each year. DocuSign can help them act fast to procure goods while staying compliant with their company processes. Using our party management features in DocuSign CLM, shown here, procurement managers can see all of their vendors right in CLM and get important details on those partnerships. They can drill in to see key information like business type, contact information, expiration dates, and important related documents, all presented in a clean, modern interface. And because DocuSign integrates with ERP systems like SAP Ariba, the procurement team can rest assured that the information is accurate and up to date. Now in this case, procurement can see whether or not they're operating under an active MSA with the supplier. And if they aren't, they can quickly act to process a new master services agreement with just a few clicks. Here, the new MSA happens to be on third-party paper, and it must be uploaded to the party record in order to reactivate the relationship. After uploading a new MSA, our machine learning and decision engines kick in with an automated review of the agreement, detecting key attributes like the document type, which helps to minimize classification and processing errors. Once the new MSA has been uploaded, the party record is activated. Now drilling into the MSA, the new 360 degree view in DocuSign CLM provides a clear summary of the agreement. And it also highlights the next task this user needs to perform. Reviewing an agreement can require a lot of collaboration across departments. Key information found by our AI might trigger relevant DocuSign CLM workflows that loop in stakeholders like those in legal as part of the review process. Then, DocuSign Analyzer helps the business and the legal teams to quickly assess the level of risk in agreements and to expedite their reviews by identifying specific contract risks and summarizing those into an aggregate risk score as shown here. If the risk score requires deeper analysis or changes to address concerns, the legal team can access the same analyzer functionality directly in Microsoft Word, legal's frequent tool of choice. Consistent experiences with familiar tools aid adoption and standardization of practice. The modular design and the reuse of Analyzer ensures that standard processes are met across all agreements, even when some documents happen to originate from outside of the company. Once Legal's review is complete, the workflow advances, and the MSA is sent for signature. Now, when all parties have signed, 
Procurement can see that the new MSA has been updated on the supplier record in SAP Ariba as well, and they can proceed with sending out an auto-generated purchase order. By connecting the procurement system to the agreement cloud, DocuSign has saved procurement the hassle of manually updating data in different systems, while also ensuring finance has an accurate, error-free view of how much they're spending with each vendor throughout the source-to-pay process. A procurement manager can also be proactive about managing upcoming renewals using DocuSign's CLM's built-in renewals report. With just a few clicks, she can begin addressing contracts by vendor well ahead of their expiration dates. Ultimately, DocuSign Analyzer and built-in CLM reports add intelligence and visibility that helps teams act efficiently on deep insights. CLM features like party management and integrations with SAP Ariba enable procurement to control cost, to reduce risk, and to improve their buy-side scenarios. With DocuSign CLM, large organizations can more effectively manage their contracted relationships on the sell side and on the buy side. At DocuSign, we're delivering the next big cloud, a collection of applications and platform services unified by a common design system featuring a modern, task-focused user interface and AI-assisted experiences. Earlier, Scott talked about how we win. These are the same areas where we're focusing our development efforts. We want to be the best way to agree to anything anywhere. We will keep expanding our application portfolio, delivering new products of our own, and extending the capabilities of productivity and communication applications like Google G Suite and Slack to power the anywhere economy. Compelling user experience matters, and our products across the agreement cloud are unified by our design system, internally referred to as Inc. Our internal design system has been refined with feedback from over 6,000 research participants in the last year alone. Inc. brings simple, clean, consumer-grade design to the power of our business products. This design approach keeps customers focused on the tasks and the insights that they need to keep their agreements moving forward. Automating the end-to-end -end agreement process is another area of focus. We do that with our own applications and by enabling everyone to connect to the agreement cloud. In the last year, we have significantly expanded our REST APIs and SDKs featuring sending, signing, identity, and rooms capabilities with many notable new or improved integrations. Keller Williams, for example, deeply integrates DocuSign rooms for real estate capabilities directly into the platform and applications experience they give to more than 100,000 real estate agents worldwide. ServiceNow created a new version of a DocuSign spoke to enable direct integration with their customer workflows. They also did a new e-signature integration in their legal services management product. And in the rapidly changing world of healthcare, No2 provides electronic medical records, EMR, EHR integrations with DocuSign. And the list goes on. Our developer community is strong and it's growing. Of the tens of thousands of new developers who signed up to get an integrator key from DocuSign last year, more than half of those came from outside of North America, a trend I really like. And finally, as Scott noted too, DocuSign's becoming the platform of record for agreements, and we're building on our trust foundation to provide a differentiated level of control, of visibility, and AI-powered automation. At the platform level, we will continue to focus on engineering for scale, instilling these common attributes into every piece of technology that we build or buy. We're differentiating in the amount of visibility and control that we give to administrators. Enterprises with multiple accounts can already get a rolled up view of their accounts by department, and they can manage users efficiently through both our admin portal or our admin APIs. DocuSign Monitor, just introduced last quarter, leverages our existing telemetry subsystem and our investments in machine learning in our platform to highlight user login and sending activity within DocuSign for individual customers. The same data that we use to generate alerts in the DocuSign Monitor application can also be forwarded to Splunk ES or to whatever enterprise security management tool the customer already uses so they can manage their security risk profile the way they want to. We want our platform to fit in with the customer's existing operational tools and protocols. We believe compliance and control are core elements of establishing and maintaining customer trust. 
We also believe AI needs to be infused into everything we do. The machine learning and analytics engines from SEAL software already power DocuSign Insights and the accelerator packs that we ship for legal, finance, and other contract analytics scenarios. That same AI engine powers DocuSign Analyzer in our Insights product, in our CLM product, or in a third-party application like Word, which I showed you earlier. And over time, you'll increasingly see more AI-assisted experiences like auto-tagging and clause detection showing up throughout the entire agreement process as we infuse AI into everything we do. Fundamentally, we believe that customers want to work with a common set of applications built on a trusted technology platform that integrates deeply into the everyday tools that they use in today's everywhere economy. The DocuSign Agreement Cloud is the only solution that enables companies to transform and integrate the entire agreement process from end to end. I appreciate the opportunity to engage with you today. And now, let me pass it back over to Annie. Thanks, Tom. That was great. We'll now take a quick 15-minute break before we move on to Lauren and our go-to-market strategy and financial overview. Welcome back, everyone. Now I'd like to hand it off to Lauren Adelhoff, our Chief Revenue Officer, to talk about our go-to-market strategy. Welcome back. I love to follow Tom. You know how we sales guys are, always coming behind the product, guys. When I see the innovations and how we've matured from a single product to a platform, it drives home what an incredible selling opportunity we have at DocuSign. I'm really excited to be here with you to talk about our go-to-market strategy. But since it's my first time being with you, I wanted to share a little bit about my background at DocuSign. This coming July will be 13 years since I joined the company. And there were a couple of things that drew me to the opportunity back then. Number one, what we do is so easy to explain to people and the value is so real. And number two, our products can be used by anyone, anywhere, in any industry. So the opportunity is huge. These are just two of the things that I believe make us unique and are still true today. In my time here, we have grown from a single office in Seattle to 18 offices around the world from one main customer segment in real estate to truly being able to address any company in any industry and from a single core sign product to a platform company. So let me jump into our go-to-market. You've heard about the size of our TAM and from a sales perspective, what is exciting is that we have tremendous brand awareness and reach and yet these are still the early days. We are just barely scratching the surface of where we can take our business. Over time, We've developed a multi-channel approach to our customer's journey to make sure that we are meeting them where they are and as they grow with us. There are several ways that a customer can engage with us today. The first is through our software as a signer, which doesn't require that you are a paying customer. The second is through our digital channel, which is an incredible source of both leads and sales. The third is by working with our direct sales teams which are oriented to help prospects and customers understand and unlock the value of DocuSign and the broader agreement cloud. And the fourth is through our partner ecosystem. Starting with our signers, we have hundreds of millions of users who have engaged with our brand and who have had a great experience with us. Over the years, nearly a billion people around the world have signed an agreement using DocuSign. That's pretty impressive. So when people think of eSignature, of course they think of DocuSign. And as they use our products and send down agreements to be signed, they broaden DocuSign's exposure to customers and non-customers alike. When those agreements move back and forth around the world, they drive people to our website and digital channel where they can trial the product or immediately buy it. In fact, one of our largest sources of pipeline comes from people who are asked to sign a document and want to learn more about what we do and how we do it. Every month, we generate hundreds of thousands of trials that result in paid digital customers. Last year alone, we delivered a few million trials ending the year with over 700,000 paying digital customers. Any company would love to point to numbers like that, but there's still tremendous amount of opportunity ahead of us. The next way in which customers and prospects engage with us is directly with our sales teams. Our field organization has always been key to how we grow our business. This is even more important today as we mature into a platform company. From a direct selling orientation, we have a fairly complex model 
to address the reality that we can sell across so many different customer types. First, we are organized around four global regions, North America, EMEA, LATAM, and APJ. North America has long been our biggest market from a customer and product perspective. In the last few years, EMEA has developed at a very fast pace and looks very much like North America from a go-to-market perspective. We recently brought together our EMEA enterprise and commercial businesses under one leader to capitalize on the opportunities we see and to better develop our top talent to grow the business. LATAM has grown at a steady clip and now that CLM products are available in market, I expect to see even stronger results. In APJ, we've attracted several new leaders who bring deep expertise in multi-product platform selling and running businesses at scale from companies including Salesforce, and Cisco. Add to that the tremendous opportunities in the region around enterprise selling and areas like public sector, and I expect to see a tremendous amount of potential over the next couple of years there. As each market grows, we focus our efforts on the needs of distinct customer size. One of my top goals since taking on the role of CRO has been to standardize our go-to-market motion globally. Within each region, we also organize around customer type, from SMB at the low end to mid-market and majors in the commercial segment to enterprise at the top. Regardless of vertical or customer size, our entire sales force is enabled to sell across the entire Agreement Cloud platform. We also orient our go-to-market teams to address new customer acquisition and install base expansion opportunities, what you know of as a hunter-farmer model. This model has been incredibly successful for us and has resulted in both significant uplift to our new customer acquisition rates, as well as strong growth in upsell and cross-sell rates both of which are critical to driving the growth of our business. Another key area for us is verticalization. We adopted a vertical orientation early on in the sign days, and that has set us up well from an agreement cloud perspective. At this point, we're probably more vertically oriented than other companies our size, and we still have massively untapped potential in this regard. What started around the needs of a few highly regulated industries has evolved to teams focused on financial services and insurance, healthcare, public sector, legal, education, not-for-profit, and real estate. The sheer diversity of our install base across verticals differentiates us and allows us to weather ups and downs in any particular industry. In North America, we're growing our vertical focus for fiscal year 22 by introducing a new team dedicated to what we see as emerging verticals for us as a business around industries like manufacturing and retail, as well as technology to meet more specific customer needs. You've heard Dan talk about DocuSign as a customer success company. This is something we think about all the time in the field. The more our product is used by customers, the greater the adoption and the better the outcome. Our direct selling motion includes an account executive who acts as the captain who is really focused on solely growing the account. We also have renewal managers who drive customer retention. And aligned with our direct go-to-market is our customer success motion, which is focused on driving greater adoption of our solutions and ensuring customers are optimizing their purchases. Over the last few years, we have invested in everything from low-touch self-service to dedicated customer success and engagement managers for our most complex customers. We've also introduced incentives for our sellers around consumption and adoption to ensure everyone is focused on post-sale customer success. The goal is to drive customers to adopt even faster while delivering an incredible experience and opening up additional opportunities to grow with us over time. Ultimately, successful customers also become an important marketing channel for DocuSign, whether it's an individual talking to their peers about the value that we bring, or as we often see, a DocuSign champion at one company moves to a new company and becomes a champion there. The final dimension of our go-to-market is aligned to partners. We work with three types of partner delivery models. First are the resellers who are critical to driving two motion. One 
is a procurement motion that delivers value to us in areas like highly regulated industries. Think Kerasoft for public sector. And two is localized go-to-market capabilities across geographies and industries where it may not make sense for us to invest directly at this time. Resellers all over the globe are seeing the value in what we're bringing to customers with the Agreement Cloud and are regularly approaching us. Second, our technology partners, or ISVs, who bring deep expertise and integrate our solutions into their offerings. This has been an area where we're seeing growing demand. As Tom just mentioned, Intuit is a great example of how these relationships are growing. Intuit has been a partner of ours from, since 2014, leveraging eSignature in its tax products to enable users to sign tax forms electronically. In the last month, we've expanded our strategic relationship to announce an integration with QuickBooks, which enables their users to sign estimates and quotes. The result is an accelerated time to revenue while allowing these businesses to focus on their own higher value customer activities. Additionally, we've also announced an integration solution with Intuit's Profile Tax product that focuses on Canada, continuing to accelerate our ISV relationship with them. These actions show the value of strategic partners adding DocuSign as a key enabler of the Anywhere economy. And as a best of breed solution, DocuSign is a brand of choice and one that their customers will value. Third are global and regional SIs. As the agreement cloud has evolved, the need for a more robust and highly capable SI ecosystem has become increasingly important in making sure our customers are set up for success. As a partner-led services model, we are focused on accelerating the build out of our capacity worldwide along with delivering expert services through our SIs. That means doubling down on partner enablement and building an augmentation model to help as they develop their Agreement Cloud practices. With the build out of the Agreement Cloud products, SIs are increasingly recognizing the value of working with DocuSign and the opportunity for partners to drive deeper service engagements with their customers. This represents an area of significant future growth for us. Partners are also a way we are expanding our presence internationally. As the biggest piece of our TAM, international growth is key to our success. Today we have customers in 180 countries globally, but take a differentiated approach to how we invest in our go-to-market across each. Our heaviest investment and most comprehensive multi-channel presence is in our Focus 8 countries. This is where we've made our biggest investments in our direct motion, built a fully localized digital experience, and begun to develop a robust partner strategy. When identifying the next tier of targeted countries, we will first look for larger economies where we see significant demand through our digital platform to seed the market and begin to drive awareness. From there, we'll look to develop a strong reseller presence while making more targeted direct investments when the time is right. As we map our go-to-market to our customer journey around try, buy, and grow, it really is all about a multi-channel approach to meet them where they want to be met, whether digital, direct, or partner-led. This leads to greater and greater opportunities over time for us to deepen the relationship. Again, something I think is pretty unique to DocuSign. So now, let me share what this looks like from the eyes of a customer. Let's say a customer began as a user who was receiving and signing documents. Within a year, that user purchased an account via our website. Just a few months later, we closed our first direct deal with them in a single department. Over the course of the next two years, they added three new departments and shortly thereafter made the decision to enter into an ELA based on the ROI that we had provided. Meanwhile, along the journey, it's not unusual to see up to 40 partner integrations, including Salesforce, Workday, Microsoft, as well as custom-built applications in one single company. This can also include additional integrations as an SI partner does a larger digital transformation program and brings in DocuSign across more areas of the business. And what's even more compelling is that this was just for eSignature. 
the account team now has a ripe opportunity to begin to position the broader agreement cloud. The opportunities out there are limitless, and our go-to-market is designed to address as many of them as possible, regardless of how a customer comes to us. So I'll close with touching on the strategic investments that we are making to continue to grow this business at scale. We'll continue to lead with a digital-first and partner-led strategy to prioritize our market expansion and direct sales efforts. Next, we'll accelerate investments in customer adoption and growth across the globe in every customer type across verticals. And finally, we're driving productivity as we continue to focus on enabling our sellers from a platform selling perspective. I am incredibly bullish about this business over the long term. I think the world we are in now, where people have the expectation to do anything from anywhere, favors us at DocuSign. So with that, I'm going to turn things over to you, Cynthia. Thanks, Lauren, and hello again. I know most of you, but for those I haven't had the chance to meet yet, I'm excited to have you join us today for our inaugural Analyst Day, and I'm equally excited to be here with you. Being on DocuSign's board the last few years and chair of the Audit Committee has been a pleasure. However, I'm thrilled to now be working alongside Dan and the entire team here at DocuSign in an operating capacity to help the company grow and scale to $5 billion and beyond. When I take a step back and I think about it, we are just getting started. So thinking about $5 billion and beyond, how do we get there? I'll be talking with you today about four key areas ranging from laying the foundation for that growth, diving a little deeper into our business model, highlighting the various expansion levers we have, and finally ending with just how much leverage we see in our model. Let me begin with the foundation for our growth at scale. Fiscal 2021 was a monumental year of first. We crossed $1 billion in revenue and reached nearly $1.5 billion in the same year. International revenue was approaching $300 million. Billings surpassed $1.7 billion for the year, and we are well on our way to the next billion. We showed incredible operating leverage with 12% operating margins and free cash flow of 15%. And just about every other metric you can think of was equally impressive this year, from direct customers to dollar net retention and more. We grew number of total customers to 892,000, adding nearly the same number of customers this past year as we had in total at the same time we went public. We had close to 600 customers greater than $300,000. And dollar net retention was at record high of 123%, exceeding our historical range for the third consecutive quarter. As Scott talked about, perhaps the best indicator of DocuSign's potential is the incredible market opportunity in front of us. Our brand recognition is off the charts. DocuSign has become synonymous with e-signature, and we are a critical pillar in the anywhere economy. As the trusted and market leader in the industry, we've got a bird's eye view of where different organizations, customer segments, verticals are in the digital transformation process and how we can help them move faster, smarter, more securely and efficiently across the agreement process. We are going after a $50 billion market opportunity and are just scratching the surface of a market moving from offline to online, from pen and paper to automation. From our vantage point, there's a long way to go. Just how long? To give you an idea, I was a software internet banker for quite some time, and I can tell you it's rare to see a company like DocuSign growing so quickly at scale 17 years after it was founded. Many SaaS companies go public after six, seven, eight years with a couple hundred million dollars of revenue and some pretty big losses. But DocuSign was different. The company was building something special, a very horizontal platform that could be used by just about any organization in the world to help streamline their business and help them come to agreement faster. So while it took us that long to reach a billion dollars in revenue, from our vantage point, it's not surprising to see that we're already halfway to our next billion in less than a year's time. So how do we get to that next billion and the one after that? by focusing on driving growth at scale. It's a unique recipe for each company, yet one that often has similar elements. The first is innovation. As you heard Tom talk about, DocuSign has been a nonstop innovation engine for well over a decade and counting. 
Sure, we could have just built our e-signature product and stopped there, but we kept listening and learning from our customers and thinking about the next step forward. In doing so, we introduced the Agreement Cloud because it's not just about signing. It's about coming to agreement and enabling that process for all people and organizations worldwide. And in order to do that and make our customers successful, innovation has to be top of our list. A close second for sure is having multiple ways to grow and expand with our customers, whether it's increasing volumes of envelopes, adding new use cases, our go-to-market organization is second to none. Lauren described the incredibly effective way our model works to drive brand recognition and lead generation through our digital engine. This creates a network effect and leverage with a digital first motion, which allows us to then have our salespeople focus on direct new customers and upsell opportunities, big and small. It's a rare company that has the breadth we do in our go-to-market organization, from the individual up to the Fortune 50, across vertical industries and geographies, as we're just getting started. Third has to be building our customer success and partner ecosystem. These components are critical pieces of our value proposition. Getting our customers up and running and successful on the platform is our top customer priority and will drive our Agreement Cloud strategy. We also invest in our partners, from resellers to SIs and beyond. DocuSign's set of partners spans across tech and even competing entities because they recognize just how important DocuSign's leading position is. So to have over 350 pre-built integrations for customers to choose from in order to get up and working quickly is crucial. And finally, perhaps the less glamorous, but no less important, is the scaling of our platform and operations. From our product platform and sales capacity to our infrastructure and back office systems, we need to be prepared to meet the needs of our customers and the opportunity in front of us. If this year has taught us anything, it's that. We're working hard to make sure we're ahead of the curve, especially as we continue to scale. Now on to our model. I know most of you are well-versed on our capacity-based subscription model, but I thought I'd spend just a few minutes highlighting some of the key elements. We're a high growth recurring revenue model with a strong dollar net retention of 123%. We operate under a prepaid model where customers buy from us in two ways. First, they select their product and what level of functionality they need. Second, they choose a capacity needed for their particular use case or cases. This is a set quantity that is prepaid upfront. While some digital customers have monthly contracts, the majority of our customers operate on a one to three year contract with a dollar weighted average of 18 months. We bill annually in advance, so duration typically does not come into play in our billings metric. And in terms of overages, we typically don't charge for them, but use it as an opportunity to upsell or early renew. All of this has led to strong and consistent growth at scale. 95% of our revenue is subscription-based. The other 5% is professional services and some small in-period revenue. As you can see, subscription revenue typically outpaces total revenue. About 12% of our total revenue comes from digital web and mobile, which is our self-serve channel, the rest from our direct sales. As you know, we report billings growth each quarter. We all know the pitfalls of billings. Volatility, fluctuations due to the timing of deals, including renewals, which results in less predictability versus revenue, which is why we focus on revenue and for billings, we look at a trailing 12 month average rather than a single quarter or point in time. We had a record quarter with over half a billion dollars of billings in Q4. If you look back pre COVID, what you'll see is that the average billings growth generally fell in the low to mid thirties. While we may not see the peak billings growth rates that we saw during the early days of COVID, we expect to continue to see strong growth rates, especially at our scale. And with $1.7 billion in billings as of year end, that's a pretty impressive start to the year. A big component of this is our many areas of diversified growth. With nearly a billion signers over the year, our global reach is unmatched. While not all users will become customers, the awareness, 
brand recognition this drives for us is critical. With less than a million total customers currently and just 125,000 direct customers, there are millions and millions of more customers that are still doing things manually. Just think of the number of businesses in the U.S. alone, over 30 million. And you can tell by our growth rates, we're continuing to see success in unlocking new customers, getting them onto the platform, driving ROI for them, all while creating more opportunities for our customers and helping drive DocuSign's growth. And those customers run across just about every vertical you can think of, healthcare, education, financial services, public sector, technology, business services, retail, you name it. Over 75% of the Fortune 500 are DocuSign customers. In other industries, that might sound like a mature market, but for e-signature and the rest of the agreement cloud, it's just the beginning. And yes, we have 15 of the top 15 financial services companies as our customers, but that does not mean that virtually any of them are yet fully penetrated. That's yet to come. And one of the biggest reasons our sales force is as excited as we are at their prospects. One of the important things to remember is that most of our revenue and market penetration to date is in the U.S. Internationally, DocuSign reaches over 180 countries through our digital channels, reflecting a big opportunity as most countries are even earlier than the U.S. in their digital journeys. At the time of our IPO, our international business was about 17% of total revenue. Since then, it's grown to about 20% of the business in fiscal 21. While that doesn't seem huge for a company of our size, and we'd agree, we've made some sizable headway this year and have brought additional senior leadership to the team across the globe as we see it as the biggest potential growth driver of our future. The strength of our international business has been overshadowed by the scale and continuing robustness of our U.S. business. Last year, international sales grew 67%, fast approaching $300 million in revenue. As Lauren mentioned, We've been focused on our core eight countries and really driving customer adoption as we continue to look to the future and identify other countries through our digital channel and partners. Expansion from our existing customer base continues to drive the vast majority of our revenue. As you can see here, we're making good progress and the pacing and sizing of expansions is accelerating with each cohort. Given the breadth and depth of our customer base, we have no customer concentration or reliance on any one cohort. To give you some flavor, when you look at our top customers, they can start anywhere from a few hundred dollars to a million dollars or more. On average, their first expansion occurs at the one year anniversary, and it takes several more years before they reach a million dollars in ACV. With such a huge influx of new customers last year, the potential pipeline of expansion opportunities is growing. We have to make sure we execute and help our customers be successful. And we're doing that through our investments in our customer success organization. To make sure we set our customers up for success, get them up and running on the platform, help them utilize the capacity they've purchased and see the advantages, all while developing new use cases for other parts of their organizations. All of this has driven a consistently strong dollar net retention. Historically, we've been in a range of 112 to 119 percent, and based on our experience, anywhere in that range was a healthy place for our business. Like the rest of our business, this number has been driven primarily by e-signature, and to a lesser extent, and more recently, expansions into the rest of the agreement cloud. The calculation is based on bookings. In the last eight quarters, and with the onset of the Anywhere economy, we've seen a pretty remarkable trajectory upwards and outside of that range to a record high of 123% this quarter. While I can't say that it will continue to go up and to the right, we do expect at least to be at the high end of our historical range this year. As we continue to see a big opportunity to upsell into our existing install base, particularly given the number of new customers we have added over the last 12 months, at the same time, that denominator is growing, and we all know that gets harder and harder to drive proportionately at scale. And finally, let me touch on our operating leverage. This chart pretty much says it all. Since we went public right around non-GAAP break-even, 
operating margins have significantly improved, up 7.5% over last year. Having ended the year at 17% in Q4, we're really starting to see the potential of our model as we demonstrate high growth at scale. Our first priority is to grow the business, and we will continue to look for opportunities to invest for growth across the massive market opportunity. Given our position in the market, it's ours to win. However, we are building a long-term sustainable business, so we'll continue to see operating leverage, even if not at the seismic levels as last year. We will continue to push towards our target model of 20 to 25% operating margin over the next few years. Of course, the biggest component of that is our sales and marketing expense. Since IPO, we've driven it down seven points. So again, while we don't expect to see quite as drastic a move as we did last year, we are increasing capacity while driving solid productivity, efficiency improvements, and optimizing our land and expand motion. We are doing this by balancing our operating goals with important investments like our digital first motion, where and how much sales capacity we're adding and when. R&D, on the other hand, has largely been operating within our target model range. We expect continued investments in e-signature to grow our leadership position and to make the rest of the agreement cloud available everywhere we sell as we democratize many of those offerings. With innovation as an ongoing priority, we will continue to scale ahead of the consumption we are seeing. One important element of investment is improving the predictable value of our product releases. We're doing this by building out software development lifecycle teams and corresponding processes to orchestrate across different releases. We've also established efficient shared services in order to put better organizational structures in place to allow product development to scale and optimize operating processes better. Finally, we're making sure we have the foundation in place to help build a single platform across the DAC, and product experience is implementing a design system across the DAC products. Perhaps one of our most impressive metrics this year was the growth of our cash flow margins, up eight to nine points over last year, excluding the $75 million debt discount. Or said another way, operating cash flow of 26% margin and free cash flow margin of 20%. Overall, we've seen strong leverage as we've continued to invest in the platform and new products to support growth. We expect CapEx to mostly be directed towards platform infrastructure expense to support elevated capacity demands. Facilities CapEx has mostly been at normalized levels and related to the completion of data centers. As you know, we recently completed a set of financing transactions to put together a more strategic capital structure as we head into the next phase of our growth. In January, we completed a $690 million convert at a record premium and a 0% coupon due in 2024 to take down roughly $460 million in principal from our existing 2023 convert. And we also put $144 million on the balance sheet. Additionally, we put in place a $500 million revolving credit facility with a $250 million accordion option. Over the course of the last few years, you've seen us make several investments and a handful of acquisitions as we built out the agreement cloud. While our cash flow is more than sufficient to cover our working capital needs, we took these steps to give us the maximum amount of flexibility to take advantage of future potential opportunities as they arise. All of this culminates in our long-term target model, which we're on track to achieve on schedule in the next two years. As we've said all along, we believe we can achieve these targets while driving growth at scale. Always the caveat to that is growth is our number one priority. So where we see the opportunity to invest into demand, we will. So before I hand it over to Annie to help us with the Q&A, there are three things that sit atop of my mind about DocuSign, the rarefied air we occupy, and why I'm so excited to be part of the team. First, the opportunity is massive and the runway almost equally so. Second, growth will continue to be our number one priority as we strive to execute on the multiple growth levers in front of us. And finally, the strength of our operating model is becoming clear as we reach scale. 
and I'm personally thrilled to be part of it. And now back to Annie. Thanks so much, Cynthia. And now we'll move on to Q&A for everyone. As a reminder to our analysts, you're welcome to submit a question via the Q&A function in Zoom. So with that, let's get started with our first question. So this one, this one basically is for Dan. What we're looking at here is in terms of, in terms of ultimately how investors should think about DocuSign post pandemic the sustainability of our growth, and why you believe DocuSign will be above pre-COVID levels. I'll turn it over to Dan. Thanks, Annie. Yeah, uh, I think this is uh, you know, a core question that we've been talking with everyone since the last earnings, as we're starting to see a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel you know, with vaccines uh, to think we're gonna come to some sort of new normal. Uh, we're calling it back to better uh, at DocuSign. And I think what we've seen are a couple of factors. One is that, uh, the transformation that our customers are undergoing and leveraging DocuSign to drive, this is not a short-term thing. This is not something that just sort of happened uh, because of the pandemic. This is something that was happening and it's been happening for years and we believe it's gonna continue to happen for years. We think that what we've seen happen because of the pandemic is that we've seen sort of a, a one-time step up where people actually accelerated their transformation at a, at a faster rate. Uh, and we've talked about the fact that we had, you know, 50% revenue growth last year. Well, that's wonderful. And we're pleased about it. It's probably not going to be um, sort of the new normal uh, for us uh, as much as that would be attractive, even at these, you know, higher and higher revenue levels. Um, but, but we are pleased to see that the core things that were driving that, the transformations, the ROI people are getting, the roadmaps that our customers are showing us about all the additional things they want to do, that's just with a signature as well as the rest of the DocuSign Agreement Cloud. We feel that we're so early in the TAM and we have a significant uh, amount of time uh, uh, time ahead of us for this kind of, of very uh, aggressive growth. Great, thanks, Dan. Next question comes from Michael Wells Fargo on customer penetration. So Scott, I'm gonna send this one over to you. You've mentioned mid single digit type penetration in the past. Is there a chance we can revisit that? Do you have a sense of what penetration looks like today in the US versus international? And what informs that number from your vantage point? And then secondarily, does that also hold across key verticals? So Lauren might wanna chime in after that. Over to you, Scott. Great, thanks Annie and hi everyone. Uh, so as we've been saying, we're early innings uh, in the opportunity and we're in the single digit uh, penetration in the United States, and it's even smaller where the majority of the TAM is uh, internationally. I think the biggest thing, and Dan hit on this, if you think about the last 12 months, the biggest change is the addressability of that TAM. And so we are seeing the increased brand awareness, and we do studies all over the globe in our core countries, and you can see the awareness for the e-signature categories dramatically increased. And also the awareness of DocuSign has dramatically increased. And we're seeing that translated into more traffic to our website, more trials uh, downloaded uh, directly off of our digital channels. So I think the, the big fundamental takeaway I think that's happened with COVID, yeah, we saw that acceleration that Dan uh, uh, mentioned, but more importantly, the market is more aware than ever that, hey, things are moving uh, to be more electronically uh, executed. And so the, but most businesses still are using pen and paper. So we believe we have a huge opportunity ahead of us to grow and increasingly that, that potential customer base is primed uh, and have better understanding of that electronic signature. More importantly, the agreement cloud is gonna be something that they're gonna need to leverage. Okay, next question is from Stan, uh, Morgan Stanley. This one, I think we'll start with Dan and then, uh, and then Cynthia, you may want to chime in after that. So when you think about the path to 5 billion of revenue, what kind of time frame are you contemplating and how big will the core signature, e-signature part of it be versus the rest of the agreement cloud? Dan? Well, so we set uh, 5 billion as our next you know, kind of goal when we hit a billion. And initially we talked about maybe setting 2 billion, but we, we kind of realized that was just going to happen anyway uh, with the momentum in our business. And as you've seen, the, you know, the guidance that Cynthia has already provided is that we'll basically be at 2 billion this year. So that happened uh, pretty quickly. 
uh, just two years to, to double the size of the business. When we think about the time frame to uh, 5 billion, I think while we're not coming forward with sort of a long-term growth rate, if you see kind of the growth we've had, and we've talked about this phenomenon that Annie referred to earlier, that we think we're gonna uh, grow at rates of our revenue at or higher than we were pre-COVID, uh, you can see with the, the power of compounding, uh, it's only gonna be a few years before uh, we get those, um, you know, those uh, two doubles to get us to five. So um, it's only a few years out. And I think that the, the mix question is gonna be clearly revenue will still be the dramatic lead for us. Uh, but as we start getting to that level of around 5 billion, you'll see some of the other DocuSign Agreement Cloud products start to becoming a meaningful share. Today, they're still very small. And the reality is because of the high growth of our signature business, it's very difficult for the new products actually to take share. Right. We're not doing blockbuster sort of M&A deals to bring in massive amounts of revenue. Uh, you know, Tom and his team have been integrating small sort of add on uh, capabilities and then growing them you know, within our platform. So I think you got a few years uh, out and then you've got uh, probably a fairly substantial portion uh, of that revenue will start to be the broader agreement cloud as we hit that five billion dollars. Yeah, and Dan, I think you um, you covered that question well. I think the only thing I would, would add is, um, one, our guidance this year is just below $2 billion, right? But the point is we're growing tremendously at scale and we're growing faster than we were pre-COVID at a lot bigger volume uh, type of numbers. Um, and I think that the second point is, is just around you know, our, our growth at scale, and, and we could really get to $5 billion, um, you know, just on e-signature alone. And as, as, uh, as you mentioned in, in, um, in Momentum earlier, we're really defining a category here, right? And it's going to take some time and we're building out kind of our product capability and, and customer use cases um, across the, the category. And so it will take time, but what will get us to 10 billion and beyond is kind of the agreement cloud and all the products we're building around that. Um, what will get us to five is e-signature with a lot of investment in growth around the agreement cloud and building out that capability across the customer base and the use cases across the customer base. So that, that's a little bit of um, color that I would add around that one. Great, thanks, Cynthia. Uh, next question comes from Michael of Wells Fargo around, and a couple of people have, have been asking about this, so around international exp expansion. So I'm going to send this one over to you, Lauren. So you've mentioned the likelihood of adding an additional market or two. So how repeatable is that playbook as you roll into other regions? And how should we think about incremental investments there? And is there anything you can add around how you'd expect sort of economic profile of international customer companies to that in the U.S.? Over to you, Lauren. Yeah, that's a it's a good question. Um, yeah, so so I think as you as you probably heard, we we do have a, a very specific and deliberate strategy around how we're thinking about bringing in what we consider core countries and how we invest appropriately across those core countries. As you know, we currently have uh, eight of those countries. Uh, there are certain common denominators that are evaluated around what we need to see in one of those countries or regions for us to go and invest both from a digital perspective or previously known as web and mobile, um, as well as from a direct and partner perspective. And so um, I would say the answer is yes, it's, it's quite repeatable because we've been doing it fairly successfully for a period of time now. Um, and then I think part two to the first question was sort of really around, you know, do we look to add uh, additional countries to that core list of eight? And the answer is yes, we will. As soon as they meet some of those uh, uh, those that the specific criteria that we look for, um, and and so hopefully that that answers that piece of the question. And then I think the other component, uh, which was really the the part two, is really around what what are the different uh, economic profiles coming from the different types of buyers uh, based on region or country, and they are different. Um, and and some of those things are related to the maturity that we are in terms of uh, when we came into the country. So. You look at when we came into Japan, it's quite a bit later than when we went into the UK. And so the buyer behavior is still one, as Scott mentioned, is really around education and learning. Um, and we've got a team that's very focused on that. And then the other, the other piece of it, I think really has to do with the, you know, whether the country is a common uh, or civil law country. Um, and, that, and that has a big impact on how we go to market, what products we need to make sure that we are ready to go to market with, um, and or is there an opportunity to potentially look at uh, another path or route to market in those countries via an acquisition or the like? 
Great. Thanks. Thanks, Lauren. And, and, and he, I might just um, add to that just two things. Um, one is just around international and growth, right? When we think about to the earlier question, our path to 5 billion and beyond, you know, international is going to be a huge part of that. You know, Scott said during his presentation, when you look at our TAM, you know, the majority of it is international and, and we're just in such early days there. So I would, I would just underscore the growth of international is going to be a big contributor to the growth of our path to 5 billion and beyond. And then second, um, under uh, digital, and when you think about digital first, it's really a differentiator for DocuSign in terms of that motion and how we unfold um, the international markets. And we really get additional insights into what markets, you know, our product and product portfolio might um, resonate with customers. And so I think that's, that's pretty unique to us um, and is a key, a key differentiator when we think about international. Yeah, great. Uh, thanks, Cynthia. Um, Tom, a follow-up on that question for you. When you think about the international products, are there any that come to mind, especially as you think about the different requirements country by country that our customers might have that have been real sort of differentiators for us as we think about DocuSign from a more global perspective? Sure. Um, it, you know, I mean, first and foremost, the international opportunity is big as everybody's talked about. Um, it is a little bit more complicated, which Lauren mentioned. Uh, by geography, you have different requirements for digital signature, which we already support. In many cases, there are regionally specific requirements around asserting your identity in the context of a given transaction. That's the reason we built something like uh, the identity framework that we shipped and have DocuSign identify as a product country by country. We're able to tune that with third party providers to validate uh, government issued IDs, for example, as part of completing a transaction. Um, and, you know, those sorts of things are what end up being complicated. What I would say is we're positioned actually very well uh, from my perspective. I think um, awareness has been lagging, you know, as Lauren said, as Dan alluded to, there was this big step function jump in awareness over the past year or so. And I think it, we're able to respond to the increased interest in international markets and come in and really go talk about these things that differentiate DocuSign and make us relevant to help bring more and more users on board so they can agree legally in each of these jurisdictions. Great, thanks very much. Uh, this is from, uh, this one will go to you, Cynthia. This is from Kirk at Evercore. You mentioned that you believe that you all can get to your long-term targets from a margin perspective in the next few years. Is that right? And, and what would be the reasons if that didn't happen, i.e. higher cost of, of the international business, et cetera? Yeah, so for us, just given the market opportunity, it's really all about growth. So we're on track and on pace to hit our target margins in the next couple of years. Um, and, um, you know, we've, we've kind of demonstrated that. I think last year is a great example of, you know, we outperformed on the top line and a lot of it um, dropped to the bottom line. We wouldn't expect that to continue. And we really are prioritizing kind of top line growth. And so you should expect to, to see us um, look into the market, look into the opportunity with customers and continue to invest aggressively across that, mainly in, in kind of our go-to-market, our sales capacity, um, international growth will be a big part of that. Um, and then also in R&D and continue to build out kind of the product portfolio and the product suite across the agreement cloud. So we're going to invest aggressively, um, but we should continue to kind of be on pace on our margin. But if we see opportunities to invest in growth, we will take those at the expense of margin, kind of as we go. But right now, we're on we're on target, and we'll keep you updated as we we see those investment opportunities. We'll be talking about those more. Great. So uh, this one comes from Sterling, J.P. Morgan. Adobe reported um, earnings yesterday, as you all know, and they they commented that they had about fifty percent growth in Adobe sign this quarter for the first time. This has been a little bit closer, if you will, to Docu Signs in the quarter, which, as you know, was fifty seven percent. So this one, Scott, goes to you and maybe follow up from Lauren. Do you guys see anything changing competitively in that dynamic in general, but specifically with Adobe? Yeah, great uh, question. Um, I think in general, we don't see a big uh, change in the competitive uh, dynamic with Adobe. I think clearly we've talked about uh, our uh, size uh, versus uh, Adobe sign. Uh, we're significantly uh, larger. We've, articulated about five to six times you know, bigger. Um, I think the category, as I mentioned earlier, I think is expanding. And so they're growing uh, faster off a smaller base. Um, but I think that 
as you see the maturity of these customers uh, evolve, not only are they going to want to electronically sign documents, but as Tom and, and we've been talking about as part of Momentum, increasingly the buying criteria of the customer set is going to get more sophisticated. They're going to need better ways to agree to anything, anywhere. They're going to need to start uh, managing and automating their broader agreement processes. So as new customers come into the marketplace, we believe they're going to uh, have more sophisticated buying needs long-term, which we believe plays into a lot of the strengths that DocuSign has around the investments uh, that we're making uh, in the broader agreement cloud. So um, uh, Lauren, uh, you might have a few uh, comments to add. Yeah, no, I think, I think that was really well said, Scott. I think the only thing that I would, uh, so I would underline the fact that, that uh, no, we don't see anything dramatically changing, although we always apply a, you know, a healthy skepticism as we look across our competitive landscape. There's a couple of things that I would call out, um, which is sort of how we engage with customers and what they continue to reiterate with us um, with regards to what's important to them. Um, and there's really two main categories. Number one is the infrastructure and stability of the platform in which they trust. Um, as Scott mentioned, um, it, you know, so many of our customers uh, rely on uh, the stability of our infrastructure. To, to transact some of the most valuable things those organizations do. Um, and so having that uptime um, is critical for them. And then the other one is just a very easy and neat integration into the existing and proprietary infrastructure that our customers already have. Um, and so what do I mean by that? The, the, our ability to integrate seamlessly into all of the existing systems, regardless of what vertical uh, one of our customers may be in, is really, really important and eliminates the, you know, the requirement for them to have to build uh, additional integration points or middleware. Um, and our, our ability to integrate is, is you know, best in breed. And so we can rely uh, very, very heavily, I think, on those, um, on those two, uh, those two uh, factors or, or denominators around how we go to market and how we see our product as, as differentiated. Yeah, thanks, Lauren. And Scott, and just a follow-up to that, Tom, for you, when you think about our product from a technological perspective, what do you see as the key technological differentiators and call it barriers to entry for e-signature and then secondarily moving on to CLM? Sure. Um, it, you know, Lauren's already mentioned uh, some of these and we've alluded to a couple of others. I would, I would start out by saying from a differentiation perspective, it's not just the fact that we've got a foundation of trust established with customers and we operate at a scale greater than, than the competitors. We also have hundreds of millions of users uh, that give us constant feedback and sort of guide what we do. And that's really led us to continue to drive innovation and e-signature at our core around ease of use and then differentiate by pulling more and more of the agreement process into that automation naturally. So you see ease of use capabilities like integration with Slack and Teams that we've just announced recently to reach users in the productivity apps that they use every day. You see um, capability that we showed today, uh, advanced capability like responsive signing for reaching users on any device, uh, signing insights for optimizing your signing experience end to end, um, and then advanced capability and things like identity verification that we talked about as well, and now the introduction of DocuSign Notary. And so the fundamental feedback we've received from our customers is the more they begin to adopt DocuSign for some basic scenarios around signing, they realize they're not just signing documents. What they're trying to do is actually transform their agreements. And in order to do that, you have to pull more of the agreement process into that digitization. And you wanna do that through a common experience. DocuSign offers a DocuSign branded common experience in our applications for those things, which is great. But as Lauren noted, a lot of times what the customers really value is the fact that we can deeply integrate with their brand and the experience that they wanna give their customers as well. And so, um, you know, I think one of the biggest advantages that we have is that depth of integration and the ability to fit with the experience that customers wanna to give to their clients. And if you want me to, I can comment on CLM specifically and, and the rest of the agreement planning. Yeah, I think people would love to hear that. Yeah. Sure, sure. So, um, yeah, you know, be, it's also beyond e-signature. You know, we're, we're not just focused on signing documents. That's certainly a core of what we do and we know how to do that effectively. Um, really, again, it's about agreements end to end. And so the introduction of the agreement cloud and you heard from 
uh, you know, Unilever earlier today and Snowflake as well about how important it is that there's a vision and an ability to begin to actually act on the obligations in an agreement uh, to manage them over their life cycle and become more efficient. And so with CLM, um, we're particularly differentiated and strong in the area of sell side, uh, both for the SMB scenario that I showed in a demo earlier, but also for large enterprises. Uh, if the data originates in a selling system like Salesforce, we can bind to those objects directly, make it very easy to generate uh, you know, uh, ready to go documents, negotiate those as part of the agreement process and accelerate through that cycle. A few customers and, and kind of scenarios that stand out that people buy for, um, you know, I can think there's a, there's a rather large uh, nonprofit that automates its grant making process with DocuSign and takes advantage of our advanced uh, workflow routing capabilities and a bunch of what we do around conditional routing for pre-review and negotiation. Um, you have a customer that's featured later today, uh, like Cisco, uh, as part of one of the ins one of the breakouts with Momentum that people can check out. They tend to use DocuSign um, a CLM and our analytics capabilities to go in and drive uh, like procurement. So they start with something like our differentiated procurement accelerator, and then are able to build custom models on top of that that get to more advanced functionality. It allows you to match your business processes themselves and, and to effectively make the product your own. And so one of the significant things we're trying to do around CLM is take it from the world of you know, 12 to 18 months deployment cycles and make it sort of DocuSign easy to use and bring it back to that motion where people get initial value immediately, very task focused and oriented in what they do. And then you have the strength of our professional services and our partners to build on that and expand and a lot of that same customizability and enrichment. So again, with CLM, you can make it part of your own experience, just like the signature. That was great. Thanks, Tom. Sure. Um, next question. I think this probably goes, Cynthia, to you and Scott. This is Will from Baird. What percent of revenue, following on to the CLM question, what percent of revenue does CLM really represent today? And what are the expectations for it to grow over the next three and maybe five years? And how do you, you know, how do you think about what the biggest drivers are there? Is that AI pre and post signature or how should folks think about that? So maybe I'll, I'll kick off and then Scott, maybe you can talk about the, the driver. So in terms of percent of revenue, um, we don't disclose what percent of revenue specifically, but it's a very, the agreement cloud today makes up a very small percentage of the overall revenue. And that includes CLM, it includes SEAL, it includes the AI pieces, it will include kind of notary as kind of an extension of e-signature, but e-signature is the vast majority of the revenue um, and it's, it's uh, growing really strongly. And so we're making a lot of investments across the agreement cloud. Those will become a bigger percentage of revenue over time, but I would expect by the time we get to you know, 5 billion, it will still be a relatively small proportion of revenue. And we'll be watching it closely as we make these investments because it is a, a, a huge part of our future in terms of how we're gonna grow, grow revenue over time and kind of sustain our growth over a long period of time. But Scott, maybe you can talk a little bit about the drivers across the agreement cloud and how we think about that. Great, happy to do that. So as, as we said earlier, we believe everybody's going to have an agreement cloud. doesn't matter if you're an enterprise customer or a small business. It's just a matter of time. Um, I think that there's a natural journey, though, for customers, and we see it. Um, and you got to remember, a lot of, of the new customers we brought in has, has happened over the last couple of years. And also, a lot of these new products that we're talking about, DocuSign CLM, DocuSign Insight, DocuSign Analyzer, in most cases, we've had these products uh, for less than a couple of years. So a lot of this is a new, uh, a new phenomenon. But typically our customers will start with e-signature. Most of them start in the front office. They'll start with some sort of customer facing use case and then they'll move to the back office. This is the same thing we see with CLM. They'll start with the front office and sell side contracts. And then you, you saw this with Snowflake, they'll move to the back office. And increasingly as companies get more sophisticated and we saw that with Unilever. Um, we, I was talking with a bank this week. They had already bought SEAL software and Spring CM before we ever acquired them. So they're looking for us to put these pieces of the puzzle uh, together uh, for them. So as Cynthia mentioned, it's, it's a smaller piece of our revenue uh, today, but we believe ultimately that is how small businesses and ultimately 
enterprise companies are going to want to buy. It's just a matter of where they are in the digital transformation of their agreements. And once they start having success with e-signature, both in the front office and in the back office, then they'll start automating their end-to-end -end agreement processes. We think that is the next big step, uh, hence why we think CLM will be the largest uh, contributor out next to e-signature. Um, and then, then we start getting into analytics and then we start getting into kind of unifying uh, all their agreements on one single repository. So that's how uh, we see it. We think it's gonna be an incredibly important um, to drive stickiness of our platform. Um, but also we believe it's what our customers want from us. And even if they don't buy the whole agreement cloud uh, today, they believe that that is the right vision for them. So they're willing to pay us a higher premium, uh, even if they're just using us for e-signature. And more importantly, they, they're buying into a platform that they can really grow into and grow out of. So it, it's absolutely critical uh, to our strategy. All right, thanks, Scott. So this one's from Rob Owens uh, from Piper. Dan, we'll start with you and then maybe Lauren can chime in. So over the next few years, where do you foresee the biggest vertical opportunities that are currently going through disruption driven by digital transformation? Well, so, you know, we're an interesting uh, company in that we're quite broad. We don't really have uh, uh, any concentration in one particular ver vertical, but we do have certain industries uh, that we do well in. Um, I think the uh, years ahead are probably going to initially look a little bit like the years that we've recently had in the past. If I think about financial services, if I think about healthcare and life sciences, uh, when I think about uh, the opportunity that we, I think, think is really going to be big from a, from a federal standpoint, public sector in general, but uh, federal, I think it's where we're going to have a bigger turbocharging there. Those are probably the places where I would see uh, the biggest opportunities going forward. And again, with the exception of federal, which has been you know, nascent for us, whereas the rest of the public sector has been strong. Those are the places, banking, insurance, you know, pharma, those are the places where we've had uh, our, our greatest successes in the past, but we're just so lightly penetrated. I think that's where we will continue to have uh, the biggest successes going forward. And Lauren, I don't know if you have an additional insight, but that's where I'd start. Yeah, I think that's I think that's well said. And I also um, would 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 say that the vertical strategy that we have helps to create a level of durability because we are, to Dan's point, across so many different verticals. Similar to what I mentioned around international, where we have some core countries. From a vertical perspective, we operate very, very similarly in that we have some core verticals that we go deep into public sector, as Dan mentioned, is, uh, is one of them. The good news is, is that while we may operate uh, similarly within some of those verticals, um, the opportunity, given the amount of customers that we now have in those verticals, to sell them more product is where I think the big opportunity comes. And I think that has a lot to do with transitioning um, how we talk to those customers. And Scott talked a lot about that in terms of not just selling a specific product to meet a need, but um, changing the dynamic of the, of the conversation with a customer to accommodate multiple needs across multiple departments um, inside of those specific companies. So the vertical strategy, I think, has been, um, you know, is, con continues to be core. Um, and then I think, you know, as I mentioned before, in industries like retail and manufacturing, which are not core to our business today, doesn't mean we don't touch those because we do. Um, I think we'll start to see more and more um, uh, uh, traction in some of those industries as they become uh, more familiar with their own digital journey um, and, and we'll be there to help them along that, along that path. Great. Thanks, Lauren. Um, Cynthia, this one might, might go to you and Scott. And this is from Shebley um, at FBN. With the recent capital raise, how are you thinking about, you know, different areas of expansion, um, likely inorganically? What what makes the most sense as you sit here today? Sure. So maybe just touching on the the recent financing. So that was really about kind of optimizing our capital structure and giving us more financial flexibility, just given the attractiveness of the markets right now and, and being able to um, fortify our balance sheet, but also just have um, really inexpensive capital at the ready. And so part of that is, is you know, we don't need it. Our cash flow profile is, is quite attractive right now, but to give us flexibility as we think forward into some of these growth areas. Um, I would say, you know, you should expect us to continue to do tuck-in type of acquisitions that you've seen us do in the past to kind of expand our uh, our product portfolio to accelerate our roadmap. 
Um, a lot of what we've done is really around product, tech, talent, um, and I would expect we'd continue to do those. Scott, you may want to elaborate on what some of those areas are, or, or even yeah. Tom, but, but I wouldn't expect us to do kind of blockbuster deals in the, in the foreseeable future, but we'll be opportunistic, and the, the financing was really around making sure that um, we have that, that operating flexibility, both for organic and, and also potentially inorganic um, growth. Yeah. Uh, so I'm happy to hit on some of the key themes. Obviously, can't get into specifics, but um, we feel, first off, great about the acquisitions that we've done. Obviously, with uh, Spring CM uh, on the contract lifecycle management, Seal Software, which was a leading AI company, and then Live Oak uh, to bring uh, Remote Notary, which we shared uh, uh, today. Um, so we feel great about those. Those offerings are primarily focused on kind of the mid-market uh, to enterprise. And so it being able to support the end-to-end -end automation of agreement processes. I think uh, the themes that I think you will see us continually look at is how do we open up new use cases, both in North America, but also internationally. For example, Notary was a, was a great example of that. For particular use cases, it required the agreements to get notarized. So that's why we wanted to get into remote notary. So we'll look for other opportunities to open up additional use cases that we might not have been able to access. Um, and so we'll focus on that. I think the uh, other key theme is verticalization. Um, we're very mature in our go-to-market uh, as it relates to going and attacking verticals and making sure that we understand how to apply the agreement cloud in the context of, the, of that specific industry. So we'll look for, for opportunities to get more sophisticated and make sure that we're meeting the needs of those industry verticals, uh, especially when you think about public sector and healthcare life sciences and financial services. And then I think the, the other piece that I would mention is if you think about the small end of our business, we got you know, hundreds of thousands of customers that will continue to look for opportunities um, where we can have offerings that we can sell digitally. Uh, that are super easy to implement and configure that play into our strength of our core uh, e-signature offering. So hopefully it gives you a, a couple uh, you know, key themes that we're uh, going to be continually uh, looking out uh, in, uh, in the horizon. Great. Thanks, guys. Um, next is a question from Michael at Wells Fargo. Um, basically, folks are really excited about Notary. I can't tell you how many times I've heard about it from my audience. So obviously, you know, it looks super exciting and valuable. And you guys mentioned the initial launch is the first party focus. So anything else you can provide in terms of how businesses there, how many businesses there are that fall into that category and how notary adoption could really, could really add to the sale and the and or the value of the sale when people, you know, when the analysts try to think about sort of that bucket and, and what the spend profile would look like for those customers. So, you know, Scott, I don't know if you want to start and then maybe, you know, Lauren or Tom chime in from there. Yeah, I'm happy to do that. So we're obviously extremely excited about uh, remote notary. Uh, I bet you are as well. Um, and uh, so I think there's two parts of the notary market and uh, one which is called first party and the other which we call third party. First party is you bring your own notary. So if you think about a bank, um, banks actually hire their own uh, internal notaries to sit in the bank. And when you need to get something notarized, they can do that. Um, and, and then obviously, the when you start thinking about uh, third party, that's in the case that the bank wouldn't provide the notary and you'd have to actually go find an independent uh, notary. Now, we actually believe that the current kind of TAM that we've shared uh, and just the market talks about, we think it's underrepresented because typically what they do is they think we think they, they categorize and calculate the third party. They don't really capture the first party that much because in most cases, the bank is actually paying for the notary. It's, it's their cost of doing business. Um, even though we think uh, remote notary, uh, and one of the reasons why we, we focused on the first party notary solution is our customers said, hey, this is very inefficient. We have notaries sitting across all our banks. We're paying a lot of money for that. We might not even need to notarize a document in a given day. So we really focused on going after this first party notary uh, 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 availability to give our core customers the ability to bring together a notary uh, with the customer in a remote setting uh, anytime, uh, anywhere. So uh, that, that has been the, the big focus of this initial launch. Obviously it's focused in, in uh, North America. 
But uh, Tom, uh, I know you're knee deep in the notary opportunity. I, I, I know you'll have some uh, comments and, and color you wanna add. Sure, thanks Scott. Um, yeah, I, I think you covered pretty well this notion that you know people refer outside uh, on occasion to go get that. We think that will still continue in the future to some extent. Um, and so uh, the initial focus, as Scott said, is on first party notary. I want us to consider um, you know, the facets of third party notary that are really necessary. It's that notion of being able to, if somebody just refers you out independently source a notary to, to schedule that signing experience that you need to have with the notary. And those things are all elements that are on our roadmap internally and we're working on and anticipate having delivered um, or by the end of the year. So um, it's certainly an area of focus uh, to be covering of the third party cases as well. But as Scott said, those first party cases are the ones that are very high value and that our customers were asking us to prioritize first. And a couple of things that differentiate those and differentiate DocuSign Notary right out of the gate um, is our ability to go provide customers with control, the choice of using their own notaries who work for them or contracted notaries. And that allows them to maintain a high degree of control over the quality and the branded experience that somebody has by not sending somebody out somewhere else to get something notarized with a different product, but by uh, integrating that experience very deeply and naturally into the sign rest of the signing experience that they're giving their customers. And that's reflected as well in sort of what Cynthia said with these notion of these technology and talent acquisitions that we do. Live Oak was really nice for us in that it gave us the building block capabilities and components to go build notary our way as part of sending and signing, a natural extension to that rather than again, sort of bolting something else on. So um, what I would say is our approach on it is to get after third party notary next. We're gonna do it the same way we're doing first party notary and that's to make it as seamless and natural an extension of the regular sending and signing experience. Hey Andy, maybe I'll add one other thing just from a go to market perspective. I think Tom did a really nice job talking about sort of from a product perspective and how we're thinking about that. One of the things about uh, the e-notary that I'm particularly excited about, I know the field is as well, is, um, we have a long list of existing customers that are awaiting this feature and this functionality. And, um, you know, part of the verticalization strategy that we have in terms of having our, you know, core sellers and core customer success members focused on industries is that we've been able to train them specifically on these products. And we've got, um, you know, we have demand waiting specifically in financial services, uh, you know, credit unions, uh, small, medium and large lenders, all of which are looking at this saying, while we already use DocuSign, we have this incredible digital process until we have this analog break, which is this e-notary that's very time consuming. So to be able to plug that gap, and I think part of the question, I think is what you mentioned is, is, is can we command a higher price point for that? There's no question that we can, because it's, it's really closing that last mile of the transaction for these organizations of which are already customers of ours. So it's a very exciting uh, uh, selling opportunity for us as well. Thanks guys. Uh, next one comes from Rishi at uh, DA Davidson. Dan, maybe we'll start with you on this one. So how are you thinking about the opportunity to get more champions or exports, experts, excuse me, for DocuSign um, at the larger customers in order to decrease the reliance on consultants? What <laughs> steps are we taking there? That maybe grow the number of those, you know, and help accelerate the flywheel and, and similarly, Kirk had asked something around just to general the partner ecosystem. How are we thinking about accelerating that to help the adoption? Yeah, well, so it's interesting. There's uh, two parts to that question that I have fairly different uh, responses to. In terms of the idea of building more champions in the company, it's a huge focus for us. And we actually find that if we make those folks that play like an administrator role, a key partner at DocuSign, it does amazing things for our ability to scale uh, the business. And our customer success team invests a lot in building those uh, those core uh, relationships. And if you think about some of the conversations we had with customers, particularly the ones that Scott had, uh, while well, you saw executives, you know, in Wailing and Sunny talking about our business there, uh, a lot of the power in the execution that occurs is not from the executives, it's from that core, you know, champion at DocuSign. And when some larger entities, we actually see multiple champions across different divisions 
uh, to build in this space. But the nature of the question may have suggested that we didn't want to have sort of SI partners as part of that in order to have a, a more direct relationship. And that's where I would actually differ with the premise of the question. We actually believe one of our big investment areas and scaling opportunities is to build out a stronger SI uh, ecosystem. In fact, one of the things we saw in the early days was a lot of SI said, well, DocuSign is a great company. We, we, they came to us to talk about how they could work with us you know, more closely. And the challenge is, and we sometimes joke with Tom about this sometimes, was that the software was too good. The usability was too good. And it was too easy for people to install. So the SI said, I can't make enough money on DocuSign Signature. Now, as implementations get bigger and bigger, they're starting to rethink that. And some of those SIs are coming and saying, maybe there is any signature practice. But when we bought Spring CM, we saw a complete change. And they said, with CLM and what you guys vision for the DocuSign Agreement Cloud, the SIs are now saying, we want to be part of that. So we'll lead heavily with regional SIs initially, where our, our strength has been traditionally. And then you'll see us building into the GSIs. And you know, Scott's already having conversations with Accenture and Deloitte about how we can expand that relationship. So we don't think it weakens our direct relationship. We think because of our strong product leadership space, we're not concerned that, that that's giving up some sort of control to the SI partners. We'd like to actually partner more aggressively with them and build a better total solution for our customers. Hey, Dan, the only thing I might add is that uh, we are doing a lot of work with DocuSign University in the certification of uh, our customers. So just like Salesforce certifies Salesforce admins, we're increasingly uh, focusing on DocuSign uh, University to certify more of our customers. That was one of the big requests uh, that you heard um, from Sunny. So wants more certified folks not only within Snowflake, but he wants more folks out in the general marketplace that he can hire uh, yeah. into Snowflake. So uh, that is an important for us for us as well. So I wanted to add that. Yeah, um, agreed. Thanks, guys. Um, one from Dan from Morningstar. So regarding the vertical strategy, so Lauren, this may this may land in your camp. Um, when you think about sort of beyond the selling motion. You know, how, are, how is DocuSign viewing developing more specialized vertical solutions to address the needs of, say, the U.S. federal market? I, we know you've got some around FinServe and or life science, but how are you thinking about expanding those? And Tom, you may want to obviously chime in as well. Hi, Lost. Do you want to start with Lauren? you want to start with me? Let's start with Lauren and then go, sorry, Dan, and then go to Tom. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the, the core of the question is probably have, has probably a little bit more of a product orientation to it uh, than it does go to market. But what I will say is what I mentioned earlier, which is specific to how we build integrations with the existing and core platforms that our customers are already using. So, for example, if you think about, um, you know, selling into a credit union, for example, um, you know, we can do one of two things. We can go and try to build a credit union specific product. Or we can look at a company like Meridian Link, which is an LOS or a loan origination system, um, which many credit unions already use to generate their loans. So what we've done there is we've built a seamless integration into Meridian Link that allows us and their customers to use our technology in their own native environment. And so for in that example, I think there's actually a lot more strength and rather than just building custom solutions, uh, looking at the solutions that our customers are already using and building seamless integrations into them. Do you want me to pick it up or Dan? Please go ahead, Tom. Great. I think people would love to yeah. hear your perspective. Just kind of riffing on what, what Lauren said there. I yeah. think, you know, philosophically for us, meeting the customer and the tools they already live and work in every day is really important. And so um, what we try to focus on, you know, outside of maybe, uh, real estate, where where we have a solution that tries to bring that complex ecosystem together with DocuSign Rooms for Real Estate and some of what we're doing with mortgage now. Um, we try to focus a lot on the enabling technologies and capabilities and extensions that are necessary. So take healthcare and life sciences, for example. In healthcare and life sciences, you have to incorporate a digital signature. You need to have CFR Part 11 support, which DocuSign added a few years ago as well. You need to be able to meet additional uh, KBA requirements. We have knowledge-based authentication directly integrated into what we do. And then in many cases, those customers have to recertify their solutions. And we offer 
targeted tools and add-ons for them actually derive from our own internal test systems where they are able to validate each new update that we release and do their monthly reporting and validation of the systems that they process things like drug trials in and things of that nature. So um, we really focus on the enabling technologies as much as we can in many places. And I think we've all said this here, we think having a vibrant ecosystem that consists of ISVs and SIs is really important in meeting customers where they work and providing the kind of verticalized and localized capabilities that people really need. Great, thanks guys. Um, another question, uh, you mentioned investment in data centers. Where is capacity and what additional investments might be needed to support that growth? And, um, and an, an add-on, in case they missed what you said, what were total transactions in 2020? So Cynthia, maybe we'll start with you on investments and then as needed folks can add on. Yeah, sure. So we're investing kind of across the board as we've scaled and um, similar to our go-to-market where we've talked about you know, last year, the tremendous growth in, in volume kind of in some ways demand outstripped our sales capacity and similar on our infrastructure. So across the board, whether it's data centers or cloud and kind of how we're running our technology and running technology for our customers, you know, that's a, a, a big investment area for us and one that we not only need to scale with the volume, but also the customer requirements or the geographic requirements, depending on, you know, international markets and, and trust and security, which is a big part, not only of our brand, but also of our product offering. So we're making kind of the requisite investments there and that volume is, you know, continuing to grow at pace. Um, and so that, that will continue to be kind of part of our, you know, call it growth investments, but across kind of the infrastructure layer that we, that's required to, to run the products. Great. Thanks. And I think we got time for just one more here. So um, we've been hearing this from a variety of folks in different ways. So maybe, you know, Dan, we'll start with you. And um, what gives you confidence in the new co-growth has been so incredibly strong throughout fiscal 21. You know, when you think about customers and their motivation for moving ahead with the signature, especially, you know, during this past year, one could argue, geez, if they haven't moved ahead in a once in a year pandemic, once in a hundred year pandemic, when will they? So people are trying to get at, I think, who's left out there, if you will. Yeah. Well, I think there's a lot of people left. And if you go back and let's just start this from the standpoint of the market, and then I'll talk a little bit while I'm excited about the investments we're making. But from a market standpoint, you know, we, we talk about the fact that we've, you know, coming up on 900,000 customers, but we, we believe virtually every company can become a DocuSign customer from the smallest uh, small business to the, the largest, you know, fortune company. Um, and last time I checked, uh, there were a lot more than 900,000 companies out there. So I, I think it's, it's, it's very early days, right? And we got the 25, 27, whatever it is, million businesses in the U.S. alone. Um, and so I think uh, there's a huge uh, untapped market out there. I think one of the things that's tricky sometimes when we're in a, a financial services oriented group, everyone says, everyone uses DocuSign, like who's left to, to the spirit of the question. And uh, while we're more penetrated in financial services than we are in some industries, Lauren will tell you, he's still got a bunch of new co-reps that are going into the vertical uh, and not just outside of the U.S. In the U.S., there's still significantly more. But guys, this is very early days uh, in the penetration of, uh, of the market. And the other reason that I'm, I'm pretty bullish uh, on the years ahead, you know, as Cynthia was describing, of significant growth, both of new co as well as, you know, increasing our penetration of the existing, is the investments we're making. You know, th this is a growth first company for sure. Uh, and if you look at the scale and the capacity that we're building, you know, in Lauren's direct team, it's significant. You know, we talked about international a little bit today, but, you know, we would not have asked Mike Sheridan to lead this very significant opportunity effort if it wasn't an effort against a very significant opportunity. And we see that not only from the standpoint of the core things that we want to do in those focused eight countries we are today, but the rest of those you know, uh, countries that we see direct opportunity, um, and as Cynthia indicated earlier, and this is a piece that I think may not be something we've emphasized enough, is our digital business is a really strong secret weapon for us here, right? Uh, if you think about the SMB business, only about 15% of our revenue, but on the international theater, it's a much more significant portion you know, in a lot of those markets. And so we think that not only is a big growth area, which Scott and his team are investing heavily in going after, it's also going to uncover the insights of which countries we will follow and Lauren will build, you know, a direct team to go after. Them. So we feel like we have so much NUCO opportunity uh, ahead of us uh, because the market is, you know, ginormous, to use a technical term, 
<laughs> and because I think what's really important here is we are focused on investing uh, in that growth, both in international uh, and domestically. So I, 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 um, I appreciate the question, but we don't see anything close you know, to a headwind there. Uh, we see this is a locomotive and we're going full speed ahead. Great. Well, thank you so much. Um, and thank you to everybody for joining us today. I think that's probably a good place to wrap up the Q&A. We hope you enjoyed the meeting today at, with our team. I wanted to thank everybody for all of their hard work in putting together all of the material for our first analyst day. And for those of you in our audience, we will be sharing the slides later this afternoon and a replay will be available as of the end of this week as well. Um, so thanks again for joining us.